I am today announcing my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. The most important words of my life. I'm here tonight. I stand before you today to declare that I am a candidate for president of the United States. I am running for president of the United States. I officially announce my candidacy for president of the United States. I'm running for president. I am officially running for president of the United States. From the University of Virginia Center for Politics, this is Sabato's Crystal Ball, America Votes. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the eighth edition of the Crystal Ball webinar on the 2020 elections. And this is a very special one because we have a very special guest, a dear friend, a great scholar, and we're lucky to have him associated with the Crystal Ball. And to introduce him, uh, I turn it over to our managing editor, Kyle Condit. Uh, thanks, Larry. Uh, so it's Thursday, October 8th, the day after the vice presidential debate. We're also a week from the second presidential debate, although, of course, it seems like as we're talking right now that there is an open question as to whether that debate will actually happen or, or have both the participants. But really pleased this morning to be joined by Joel Goldstein, who we think is the foremost expert in the country on the vice presidency. Joel wrote a great piece for the Crystal Ball previewing the VP debate uh, on Wednesday morning, and we're happy to have him joining us uh, <laughs> Uh, today to to sort of break down what happened in the VP debate. So Joel, thanks for thanks for joining us today. It's great to be with you, Kyle and Larry, and uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, if this is your first time viewing the program, uh, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube uh, to follow our YouTube channel UVA CFP. You can always find our episodes uh, uh, on, on YouTube at our YouTube channel. Uh, this webinar series is also available as a podcast at many different podcast platforms, including Apple, and Spotify. Uh, just search for us there and subscribe. Uh, and our new three-part documentary series on the challenges facing democracy in the U.S. and abroad, Dismantling Democracy, is now available for streaming online at, at the website of our partner on the documentary, um, VPM, Virginia Public Media. Uh, just go to vpm.org backslash dismantling hyphen democracy. Uh, it'll be available for free through next Thursday, October 15th. Uh, and then after that, starting on October 15th, it's going to be available uh, on Amazon Prime if you want to watch it. Um, there and also, if you're if you're in Central Virginia, um, it, the whole series is going to be uh, uh, showing tonight, starting eight o'clock uh, on your local PBS station. Uh, finally, if you want to support this broadcast and other work of the Center for Politics, just text USA Votes to four one four four four. That's USA Votes one word to four one four four four, and we appreciate those who have uh, supported us. Um, so uh, with that, uh, let me just I want to. Ask the first question of Joel, just to kind of give you a blank canvas. Uh, what was your reaction to the VP debate last night? Well, I, I thought it was a really interesting debate. Uh, you know, to put it in, into some context, it's, it, it was a debate where I think the, the fact that the candidates are older than has ever happened before in, in, uh, in our history, the presidential candidates, and the fact that the president's been diagnosed positive uh, for COVID, put some greater emphasis on the vice presidential candidates. It's also the first time that we've had a vice presidential candidate who is a woman of color, or the first time we've had a woman of color as a national candidate. So I thought that uh, attracted some um, attention to it. Vice President Pence, I think, is the most effective spokesperson that the, that the Trump administration has. But I thought it was really a very good uh, evening for, uh, for Senator Harris. I think... Uh, uh, on the one hand, she could be a, a little bit more conservative in her approach because the Biden ticket is ahead, uh, but she's a newcomer. And so it was part of her introduction to the, uh, the national stage. She needed to credentialize herself as a presidential, uh, plausible presidential candidate. I thought she really did that. I thought she also did the other things that you'd want from a vice presidential candidate in a debate. She attacked President Trump. She, she defended Vice President Biden. And she did two other things that I thought were pretty impressive. She um, created some sound bites that you can see being used going forward out of the debate. And I thought the other thing she did is that, is, is the crystal ball points out, this is really ends up being uh, turning on the, the electoral college and the way different states vote. And many of her appeals seem pitched uh, or sensitive to the way voters might react in, in certain states. She talked about Senator McCain, which should be helpful in Arizona. She talked about 
fracking, which should be helpful in Pennsylvania. She talked about manufacturing jobs and Biden protecting them, which help in the Midwest, farm bankruptcies. So I thought she had a very good night. Larry, what did you think? Well, first, let me let me just reemphasize, uh, Joel Goldstein is the number one expert on the vice presidency, and he has forgotten more about vice presidents, vice presidential debates, losing vice presidential candidates than, than the rest of us have remembered. So uh, I obviously agree with everything that Joel has said. I, I thought Harris uh, won that debate, too, if, you, if you're adding it up. I also think they don't matter that much, that is, vice presidential debates. We vote for president, not for vice president. But what both candidates did well was in defining their, their uh, presidential candidates uh, further and maybe better than the presidential candidates have done themselves. Now, that was more important for Joe Biden because he's even though he was vice president for eight years and he was in the Senate since 1973, uh, he isn't deeply known. The name is well known, but he isn't deeply known as a person. And I thought Harris did a good a good job of of uh, filling in some pieces that people might not have known. For Pence, of course, he had to do cleanup, which is normally what he has done over the past four years. He had to clean up for the mistakes his boss has made. Uh, even recently, and that's always difficult because he knows his boss is watching. Donald Trump never misses a piece of, of TV that relates to him, uh, and so he had to be careful. He couldn't contradict the president, but he also had to, to get past some of the questions. I was disappointed that neither one of them answered a lot of the questions uh, that uh, the moderator posed. But, you know, that's normal for debate. You're never going to get politicians to answer questions directly. They wouldn't be politicians if they did. Um, you know, I think both of you kind of kind of made this point. But, Joel, I want to just ask you explicitly because it's something you brought up in, in the piece, you, the preview piece you wrote for us, which was that the VP debates often end up becoming more about the presidential candidates themselves as opposed to the, the VP candidates. Did you think that that happened last night? Yes, and, 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 and I, I thought it did. And I thought it was for exactly the reason that Larry just pointed out, is that uh, presidential campaigns are about the presidential uh, candidates. And, if, and, and, and as, you know, as Senator Kane said last time, if you find yourself talking too much about yourself or the other person on the stage in a vice presidential debate, you're probably uh, missing an opportunity. And so I think it was very much about uh, the presidential candidates. And, and I think, as Larry said, um, Senator Harris really wanted to, to emphasize uh, Vice President Biden uh, uh, is, 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 is a likable figure. She referred to him consistently as Joe, um, somebody who Americans could relate to. Um, and, and, and I thought that, uh, that on both sides, the, the debate really was about the, the presidential candidates, and that's how it normally is. Um, Larry, how... How much do you think we're going to remember there being a fly on Mike Pence's head from this debate? I mean, obviously, that seemed to be one of the, I mean, to the extent that there was something memorable that happened, I almost wonder if that, that might be in as, in as silly as that sounds. Now, unfortunately, that will be remembered long after most of the substantive statements are, are forgotten. I guess now insecticide will be a mandatory uh, carry-on uh, to TV sets, at least for candidate debates. You know, it, it was unfortunate for Pence because his his hair is snow white. And so the black fly just couldn't be missed. Plus, it stayed there for over two minutes. What fly ever stays stationary for two minutes? So Jeff Goldblum had to be contacted to see what was really behind this. You remember, he played the fly. That was before your time, Kyle. But Joel and I remember. Joel and I remember. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, I was thinking about the fly, and, and, and of course, Larry remembers the, the 1992 vice presidential debate, when it was, was the one vice presidential debate where there was a third candidate on the stage, Admiral Stockdale, who had been a, a prisoner of war in Vietnam for seven years um, and uh, hadn't expected to participate in the vice presidential debate. But he began his, uh, his statement by saying, who am I? Why am I here? And I thought that the fly <laughs> played the, the Admiral Stockdale role uh, last night. And the meme, the meme. 
look at Twitter today. Uh, just everything you can think of. So I think right. Kyle's right. I think Kyle's absolutely right. <laughs> the three, four, five, 10, 20 years from now, the fly is going to get as much attention as the candidates, maybe more so. Right. Right. Uh, I th- I was worried that the, the fly had actually died on his head because <laughs> to your point, it wasn't moving, Larry. So um, good for good for Pence that it, uh, that, it that it flew away. Um, you know, speaking of, of Pence, Joel, uh, we got a question from Marion Kahn, and she asked, uh, this was sort of a theme of the night, um, why would Pence's debate trainers tell him to repeatedly ignore the times allotted to answers? Uh, and, and, you know, obviously he, uh, um, he, he blew past his, his time many instances. So I think I saw that Harris actually talked longer, which certainly didn't feel like that when you were watching well, the debate. Well, I'm, su- I'm surprised because it was very noticeable. I mean, somebody said that this was the thank you, Vice President, Pence debate because Susan Page kept saying that to try and um, signal to him that his time was up and and he he blew by it. I, I don't know why he did, um, but but um, and it created a, a tricky situation. But I just wonder whether a lot of the suburban women voters that um, that the Trump campaign uh, has been trying to appeal to through a sort of a law and order. Uh, campaign and scaring them about what's going to happen in the suburbs under a Biden administration wouldn't be offended by both his um, uh, uh, talking over uh, Senator Harris, but also Susan Page, um, and, and whether it may not backfire on him. Yeah, that was mansplaining, no question about it. And by the way, most of the tweets and emails that I've gotten about this from women have specified that. They were furious that both women uh, were ignored and uh, Pence ran roughshod over them during the debate repeatedly. Pence also interrupted Harris twice as often, approximately, as she interrupted uh, Pence. Uh, Hey, why have rules in a debate if you're not going to enforce them? What happened to the button that was supposed to turn off the mics? They talked about that last time after uh, Trump constantly interrupted uh, Joe Biden. So I don't know, maybe the campaigns wouldn't agree to it, but it ought to be in there in the future if you're going to have debates. Uh, I thought it was really glaring and, and that that I would say both Harris and Pence really seem to ignore the questions. Uh, more, you know, again, this, this happens all the time in, in a debate setting, but Joel, did that did that strike you the, the same way it struck me? I thought, again, I thought it was very glaring from, from both candidates, really. Yeah, I, 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 I thought they did. Um, uh, you know, in Senator Harris's case, the main one that she really um, ignored was uh, was the one about court packing, what the Democratic position is on court packing. Um, they both ignored the question about a disability arrangement, what, whether they have a, whether they've had discussions about a transfer of power um, under a disability situation. I think it'd be understandable that that uh, if 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 Biden and Harris haven't talked about it, it's unconscionable if, if President Trump and Vice President Pence haven't talked about it four years in. And she ignored the question about the Green New Deal. I thought that Vice President Pence ignored the one about peaceful transfer. He ignored the issues of, the, of Pre- President Trump's health, um, the, the tax returns, really, the disability, um, the, uh, what, what uh, Judge Barnett's position is on abortion, um, what their plan was with respect to pre-existing conditions. Um, so I, I, I thought that it was uh, more dodging, perhaps, on the vice president's part, but they both did. And as Larry said, uh, it, it, th- this is par for the course, uh, uh, generally speaking. They always want to pivot and answer the question they want to answer rather than the question that the moderator asked. Um, Larry, did this strike you as a debate that would move the needle all that much in this race? No, no, I think it filled in some blanks, uh, certainly for most people who don't know anything about Kamala Harris. And also, as I suggested, I think she filled in a few blanks about Joe Biden. Uh, Mike Pence, uh, you know, whether you like him or dislike him and like or dislike Trump, he has gotten to be at least uh, superficially well known over the last four years. So there was less of that there. I think his major mistake and the reason why the early instant instant polls have suggested that he lost the debate to Harris is because he was so persistent in interrupting. It's funny how you remember something like that 
more than you remember the substance of the answers. Not as yeah. much as the fly, but you know, it would be in second place after the fly. Right. Well, rem remember in the, the, the George W. Bush Al Gore debates, when Al Gore's sigh became the sort of the takeaway of the debate, or, or you know, as uh, uh, Larry's written about the Kennedy uh, half century, but remember in the 1960 debates where, where there was a, a, a difference, people who saw the debate and who heard the debate came away somewhat with different attitudes. And so the visual image. So it, it's interesting how the takeaways uh, sometimes are things you might not expect. Um, Joel, last question um, for, for you. And thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, so we're, we're recording this late morning uh, on, on, on Thursday, October 8th. Um, the Commission on Presidential Debates announced that next week's town hall debate would be conducted virtually. President was on Fox Business this morning, said that he would not attend. We'll see, you know, how that ends up developing. Um, one thing that struck me, though, about, about the president in, in this sort of debate about debates this morning is that it really hammered home for me that, um, that, that, that you know, the, the president immediately took the spotlight from Pence. That however Pence did, you know, sort of a reminder that, that the VP candidates, you know, they, 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 get, they get big footed by, by the presidential candidates. Did, did that strike you this morning? Yeah, it, you know, it is, uh, but I would look at it just a little bit differently in the sense that um, that I think it's it's also characteristic of President Trump and the way he treats Vice President Pence that uh, it's, it's, as Yogi Berra would say, deja vu all over again, that, that the president has to always be commanding the stage. And I think one of the, the challenges that Vice President Pence has even more than most vice presidents is that that even if he'd done really well, the president was going to reclaim the stage very quickly and 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 sort of uh, push that out of the public's consciousness. So y yes, but I think absolutely the point you're making, Kyle, has struck me the same way. Uh, Joel, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and. Uh, uh, Joel is also uh, the author of an excellent book, The White House Vice Presidency, sort of the, 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 uh, about how the, the uh, vice presidency has really expanded in terms of scope, uh, particularly going back to Walter Mondale and Jimmy Carter in 1976 and, and, and through Joe Biden and whether, and, you know, you could imagine that, uh, um, that, you know, Pence has been an important person in this administration and, and Kamala Harris probably will be too if, in fact, uh, the Biden-Harris ticket wins. So, Joel, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Kyle. You know, I've learned so much from from Larry over the years, as we all have, that it's really a treat to be with you and be well. Joel, it was very much a two-way street since I first met you. And I always say when you're talking and finish, what Joel says. That's that's my answer when I'm asked for <laughs> comment. Whatever Joel says. So well, anyway, right back at you. Yeah, well, thanks for being with us. We'll do this again. And not, not four years from now, we'll keep this going. <clears throat> okay, be well. Thanks, thanks Joel. You too. Take and uh, uh, for the second half of the program, we're going to bring in a uh, third member of the crystal ball team, Miles Coleman. Miles, how are you? Hey, good. Uh, so in the crystal ball this morning, which we uh, invite you to read, centerforpolitics.org backslash crystal ball, um, we moved a number of uh, ratings in all four categories of races that we cover, president, senate, uh, house, and, and, and even the gubernatorial races. There, there are about a dozen of those races this year that we're following. Um, if you're curious about any of that, uh, read the crystal ball, though we did want to sort of update everyone on what we're seeing in the Electoral College right now. Um, and so we moved Arizona to lean Democratic this morning, Georgia to toss up, and New Hampshire to likely Democratic. And so can we bring up the, uh, the new map just to show everyone? So this puts uh, Biden a little further over uh, 270 electoral votes, although not, although not overwhelmingly so. We still have a number of toss-up races. Um, Larry, where, you know, where, where do you see the, the presidential race at this point? Well, we need to remember it's October the 8th as we're, as we're filming this, and it's, it's important to remember how much can change. There have been so many black swan events this year already, more than in any year since 1968 presidential year, that is. and um, But you have to say that Biden's lead, if it's not solidifying, it certainly has been stable. And I tend to think a stable lead almost certainly is solidified to a certain degree, maybe a great degree. Uh, it's very bad news for President uh, Trump that he never can seem to get out of the low 40s. Now, 
let's grant him a point or two of the hidden Trump vote. As controversial as that is, most academic studies say there isn't a hidden Trump vote, but others in polling and certainly in campaigns say there is. It's not enormous. It's not five points. Maybe it's a point or two. So you give him that. You recognize that the Electoral College is tilted toward uh, Trump and probably any Republican at this point. So as Hillary Clinton proves, you can win the popular vote by over 2% and still lose the election. So throw in another 2 or even 3% for Trump. And suddenly, he's where he was in 2016, except that the third-party candidates are much weaker, and therefore he will need upper 40s uh, to win. And getting that last few percent for him is going to be very difficult because almost everyone has their feet in stone. Um, and yeah, I mean the the, the the polls, you know, that it seems like the the, the you know the, the numbers have gotten a little bit better for Biden over the last week. He's actually, as we're as we're talking right now, is up to about a ten point national lead in both regular politics and the five thirty eight averages. A little bit smaller in the key swing states, as Larry Larry suggested which indicates that the president may still have sort of a, a little bit of an advantage in the Electoral College. But, you know, it's, the president needs these numbers to, to tighten. Um, let's move to the Senate real quick. Um, and so one, I'd say the biggest development in the Senate over the last week is uh, in, a, in a race where we didn't change the rating, but um, and that was the, the revelation of Cal Cunningham, the Democratic candidate in North Carolina, his affair. Um, now, Miles, uh, uh, you know, North, obviously the, this, is, this was a huge development in that, in that race. Although, what have we seen in the numbers since since this came out? Yeah, you guess. So it's it's uh, kind of funny because Larry was just talking about, well, a lot of people's feet are in stone. Well, guess what? We may be seeing that in that North Carolina race. Uh, pretty much PPP, uh, which is a Democratic pollster, uh, which does a lot of polling in the state of North Carolina. Uh, they had a poll out Monday or Tuesday uh, after after most of this news broke. Uh, and Cunningham had, like, expanded his lead from, like, four points to, like, he was up to about six points. And uh, even among independents, he, he was up by nine points. Or it was, so basically the takeout that got away was a majority uh, at the time, about 60% of the electorate uh, had heard of the, uh, uh, had heard of the rev had heard of the revelations, uh, but as of now, they just don't seem to care. That may change, uh, but it's a race we're watching. Yeah, Larry, what was your reaction to that? I mean, certainly, we, we, we even wrote this this morning that we had thought about moving this race to Leans Democratic at many times, and we decided not to do it, and we're glad we didn't because this is, this is something that really could make an impact, even if maybe it hasn't shown up yet. Yes, and there are always surprises, and often it's a scandal coming up in October. Sometimes parties researched it and already had the information and leak it at a critical moment right before the election. Uh, that's changed some, some votes in the past. But, uh, you know, in, I think you've had Bill Clinton on the Democratic side and Donald Trump on the Republican side with all these personal scandals, and somehow it has deadened the electorate to things that would have ended candidacies in the old days. And by the old days, I mean my youth. Uh, it's just remarkable, and we'll see whether that holds. I think Miles was absolutely correct in his description of North Carolina Senate. Uh, I can tell you this much, and you all know this, very senior Democrats are furious at, at Cunningham. I mean, I can't even describe the fury because I don't use that kind of language. But I can tell you that uh, nobody is angrier at Cunningham than Democrats. Now, if it doesn't cost in the election, they'll get over it quickly. But if it does, and this turns out to be the critical seat, well, there will be consequences. And, you know, we, uh, uh, I've, I've sort of thought that North Carolina was kind of the crucial 50th seat for Democrats. If, you know, if you think that maybe they win Colorado, Arizona, and Maine, they need at least one more to get to 50-50, assuming they lose Alabama. So, again, you could see how this could, this could swing the Senate uh, effectively if, if Cunningham uh, collapses, but at the same time, I think we need to be um, cautious in, in sort of not ruling that, ruling out that happening, but also not assuming that it will. Um, also, the Senate map I think is getting a little bit more competitive, and there are more races coming into play. Um, we do have some reader questions that actually kind of address some of the uh, rating changes we made in the Senate today. 
Um, first one from Dale Smith. Um, who do you think the top two finishers will be in the Georgia special election? Um, also, what kind of voter would vote for John Ossoff, the Democrat in the regular race, but not for Raphael Warnock, the Democrat in the special? How closely are their fates tied? Uh, and Barbara Ballier, what are her chances against Roger Marshall in, uh, in Kansas? And so um, we did switch both of those races and made them more competitive, the Georgia special and the Kansas uh, Senate race from likely Republican to leans Republican. Um, and it kind of looks possible, uh, Larry or Miles, one of you, either you can chime in on this. It looks possible we might actually have two different Georgia Senate runoffs uh, on January 5th, 2021. Yeah, I mean, they're having, uh, yeah, I mean, they're having these, uh, in Georgia, they had their special elections under the Louisiana style type of rule. So it was always very unlikely that anyone would win that race outright. Uh, but in terms of regular elections, other than states that use jungle primaries like Louisiana or like California, Georgia is the only state with general election runoffs. Uh, so even if Ossoff, uh, if he finishes ahead of of David Perdue in November with something like 48, 48, 89, well, guess what? He's still going to have to go uh to that uh uh to a january runoff and that that's that's one factor why we have that race as leans republican as opposed to north carolina which is a similar type of race but but but, but if uh but if cunningham ends up winning uh, it's easy to see him winning with the plurality and that being it uh but that runoff dynamic in georgia really helps the republicans uh, and then, you know, as for as for Kansas, that's another race. You know, the Democrats haven't won a Senate race there since 1932, which was Franklin Roosevelt's first election, um, which is just kind of amazing. And that state has been so Republican for so long. And yet both sides are just dumping in uh, a ton of money there. And it really seems like the Democrats may have a path to victory, although we do still favor the, uh, the Republicans in that race. One thing to note about our Senate ratings is that um, it, is that we've got six races rated as leans Republican, meaning that. The race for the Senate overall is close, but you can imagine the dam breaking if things go poorly for, for Republicans down the stretch. Um, Larry, Larry, I think you wanted to add something on the Senate. I, no, I think you got it exactly right. It's important to remember that even though in polling, sometimes it looks like there is a considerable gap between uh, the presidential candidate of, uh, of either party and the party's candidates for lower offices, that's what often closes, even on election day, because when people enter that booth or even when they're filling out their absentee ballot, um, they often stay in one column. <laughs> they, I guess the juices get flowing, the partisan juices in this very partisan age, polarized age that we're in. So I don't expect more than a few percent difference between the Senate uh, candidate performance and the presidential candidate of that party. So remember that. If you're looking at polling, they may have separated the questions in a way that doesn't cause partisan juices to flow quite as much as it will on election day or while one is filling out an absentee ballot. Um, we've got a number of other reader questions, and so we're going to try to treat this as sort of a lightning round. So we'll all, we'll all try to keep our answers to a minimum here. Larry, you get the first question here. This is from... Um, from Christina Melton, uh, if Trump's pick for the Supreme Court is confirmed and seated before the election, will Republicans still feel as compelled to support him? And do you think Democrats will begin to point out to GOP voters that they will have achieved one of their central goals to swing the court and that they may not need to stick with Trump anymore? No, <laughs> that's not going to happen. There is a Remember, who's most excited about this? Yes, Republicans in general, but probably evangelicals. Uh, Trump overwhelmingly won them in 2016. He's going to overwhelmingly win them again. And I think they may uh, give a uh, gratitude vote. Uh, there are certain segments of the electorate that I never proposed would give a gratitude vote, but I think evangelicals will. So, no, I think that's, I'm being blunt with you. I think it's uh, wishful thinking. Um, uh, Larry, let me ask you this one too. This is from Mason Montgomery. Um, do you think the debate format and we're, we're, next week, if it happens, is going to be a town hall? Do you think that the format has any effect um, in the debate itself? And do you personally have some sort of dream format that you would like to see in these debates? 
Well, yes, I do have a dream format, and I've proposed it many times, and the dream format is to allow the candidates to have a real debate at least for half of the allotted time. If it's an hour and a half, you have 45 minutes uh, maybe with a moderator uh, proposing questions and making sure that both sides obey the rules. Just that is kind of a fundamental, obey the rules. And then the second half of the debate should be free flow between the candidates. And yes, they're going to avoid questions. Sometimes there are questions neither one of them wants to answer. That's why you start with the moderator, uh, get the moderator at least uh, asking some tough questions, even if you don't have follow-ups. But then let the candidates go back and forth, and the moderator has only one function in the second half of that debate, and that's to assure that each candidate gets approximately the same time. You're not going to go down to the second or even a minute or two. Who cares? But if somebody's taken five or ten minutes more than the other candidate, then, yes, you have to, uh, you have to impose the rules. But that's my ideal. That's more of a debate. It will never happen. Uh, but uh, I've proposed pr dozens of things in my lifetime that will never happen. I'm very proud of that. As it, but it is happening in a parallel universe. You need to know that. There's a parallel universe where all of those ideas are being utilized, and I wish I could go there. Okay, Kyle. Um, so the next question, I'm going to use my right as the moderator to answer. <laughs> will there be exit polling of early voters? Can a race be called or projected based upon early votes? And this is from uh, Marty Byrne. So, of course, more people are going to be voting early and by mail than really they ever have before. Um, and the exit polls will try to, that, that you're going to see on election night, will try to take that into account by contacting people who voted early or voted um, by mail. I think one thing that would be dangerous to try to, it would be try to, to try to project the election based on early votes is that it seems like in most states, Democrats are much likelier to vote early or going to want, want to vote earlier, want to vote by mail. And it may be that there's a huge partisan skew between the votes counted on election day, which may be very Republican, and the early votes and the mail-in votes that may be very Democratic. So keep that in mind on election night, that some of the states might look very strange based on the uh, the vote counting pattern. And, and again, we'll, we're going to try to, as we get closer to the election, try to provide uh, some pointers about that. Um, Next question, this is from uh, Susan Rock Okrent. Um, Miles, uh, could you comment on the Missouri governor's race? Uh, initially, the incumbent, Mike Parson, who inherited the office in 2018, um, was expected to easily win, but now is likely tied with Democrat Nicole Galloway. We, uh, we talked about that race in the crystal ball a little bit this morning. Yeah, that's one that we initially had as likely R. We moved it to, uh, we downgraded it to leans R maybe a few months after that could go. Uh, usually, if uh, if Missouri is as close as some polls say at the presidential level, uh, it's easy to see Biden at least getting within single data edges there. Uh, the state auditor, uh, uh, Nicole Gallo, by the way, she was probably the best recruit that the Democrats could have got there. Um, she won in uh, back in... 2018, even the uh, even as Claire McCaskill lost, uh, and I guess Parson, he's gotten a lot of he's gotten a lot of criticism for his handling of the virus. Uh, so that's just one of those races as where we see it as uh, we could see uh, in the end Galloway doing a bit better than Joe Biden there. Yeah, that's that's uh, probably the if the Democrats have any gubernatorial pickups, that's probably the likeliest one at this point. Um, the Republicans are targeting Montana as their top pickup. That's an open seat toss up where they they, they very well may be favored in the end. Uh, next one from Hutch Livingston goes to Larry. Larry, you've referred to sometimes you've used the terminology most of the good surveys. Um, how does the average person know what a what a good survey or a good poll is? You know, what do you look for when you're looking at these polls? That's a great question. You need to know it's a secret, and that's why you have to read the crystal ball uh, two, three, four times a week and watch this webinar. I can't give away the secret sauce uh, during this webinar. But in general, look, it's, it's a matter of opinion. But by and large, I think you look for organizations that have a long track record, not that are always right. Polls can't always be right. Analysts can't always be right. You know, baseball statisticians and, and – uh, commentators aren't always right either, are they? So basically you're looking for a poll that spends enough money and does it right, probably live polling at least for a good piece 
of the uh, interview total, uh, maybe half of the phone interviews at least being cell phone, if not more than that. They're clues, uh, but rely on the ones with track records. Uh, don't just rely on one poll because uh, there are lots of problems that uh, even statistically it can be completely off uh, for uh, legitimate reasons. So, you know, I, I would say the polling averages that we look at, meaning Real Clear Politics and 538, we don't agree with the choices, uh, all the choices made in either of those polling averages. So you can always construct your own. You can throw out some ones you consider to be flimsy and do your own polling analysis, or you can simply pay attention to the crystal ball. Uh, we got a couple of questions about the main Senate race, which is one of the, the big contests this year. Um, this is from Eve Thorson. Um, how will uh, uh, how will rank choice voting factor into uh, that race, Miles? Um, there's an independent conservative named Max Lynn. There's another candidate who's more kind of a, a liberal Green Party candidate who uh, is saying that uh, uh, her backers should support Sarah Gideon, the Democrat. Um, how have we figured uh, rank choice voting into our ratings of that race, Miles? Yeah, we definitely think that uh, the on the whole, it's going to help uh, get it in more. In fact, uh, just I think last night on uh, last night on t t on t Twitter, uh, the uh, the more liberal third party candidate uh, Lisa Savage, uh, she tweeted out a picture of her ballot, and she's like, "Okay, vote for me first, vote for Gideon second, and that was it." Uh, on the right, you have this guy, Max Lynn, who kind of uh, comes across as very unhinged at some of the dub debates, to say the least. Uh, he's not giving Collins that type of uh, uh, that type of support on the other side. Uh, and just in most polling, we've seen Collins in the low authorities. I mean, it's 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 a. Uh, uh, Actually, not unlike Trump at the national level, is in that she's it's 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 been very hard for her. Uh, it's been very hard for her Collins as the incumbent uh, to sort of break out of that low forties range, uh, and we just think that the it's going to be uh, when candidates uh, when these third party candidates start getting eliminated in the county. Uh, it's going to be easier for Gideon to have a patch of majority there. Yeah, it's worth remembering, too, that, that the Democrats actually finished second in um, the main two House race in 2018, and then ranked choice voting allowed uh, uh, Jared Golden, the Democrat, to win that House race. And so Republicans are kind of frosted about ranked choice voting anyway, and so it's sort of an open question as to whether they'll, they'll participate or not. Um, last question uh, to Larry. This is from E.A. Gendron. Um, if Democrats win the presidency, House, and Senate, and then eliminate the Electoral College, although as an aside, they can't do that, <laughs> but uh, make D.C. and Puerto Rico states, which we actually talked about this week in the crystal ball, and pack the Supreme Court, how do you see the future of the country? <laughs> well, I'll tell you that uh, if and when all those things happen, because they won't, uh, <laughs> you know very well that's, that's pretty stacked. It's a stacked question. Uh, now, look, Democrats could win the presidency, the Senate, and the House. If, if it's leaning anyway here on October 8th, it's probably leaning in that direction. But remember in the Senate, even if the filibuster is eliminated, and even if it just takes a simple majority, which can be 50-50 with the tie broken by the new vice president, you're still going to end up having Democratic senators defecting on uh, this or that or the other. So the Senate will be kind of the stopper uh, in many cases. The House uh, may pass the things that are considered much more liberal than what the Senate will pass or what Joe Biden wants or doesn't want. We, we don't know how he's going to come down. He, basically, if you take his whole career and collapse it, it's center left. I know Republicans will say, no, 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 it's just pure left. No, you're wrong. And, and Democrats are hoping that he will be just left. No, sorry. He's exactly what he seems to be center left. So I think that's what the administration will be, given uh, your outcome. And the other things, you know, are tougher to accomplish than you think. Uh, expanding the court, you call it packing, I call it expanding the court. Uh, 
which I consider legitimate and has been done six times in American history. And there are a lot of reasons to do it and tie it to giving each president a certain number of appointments. Why should we be depending on life and death, literally life and death to determine when we fill seats and one president gets, you know, four or five appointments and another president gets zero? You know, I'm not willing to leave uh, our fates to the fates. I think we ought to uh, do something that makes more sense. So, you know, look, I've learned in life that we all worry too much about too many things. The vast majority of the things we worry about don't happen. So only worry about the things you have to worry about. You know, it's going to save you a lot of uh, prescription drug costs. Uh, it is kind of crazy that the sort of the fate of so much and the Supreme Court is so powerful is sort of determined by essentially kind of like actuarial tables and, you know, what, you know whether, you know, how, how, what someone's lifespan is. It's kind of it's kind of a macabre way of doing it. And, that's certainly one way if we wanted to lower, kind of lower the temperature of American politics, maybe some sort of deal on the, on the courts would be part of it that, that makes it, I'd say, maybe a fairer process, as, as Larry talks about. But um, with that, uh, 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 that, that's it. Uh, and if you have, continue to have questions, which we're going to try to get to as many as you can, so email those to us at goodpolitics at virginia.edu. Uh, again, if you want to support our program, text USA Votes to 41. Uh, 444 and we will be back uh, next Thursday so thank you for watching thanks